Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Lil Newman and this is Viewpoint. Viewpoint's mission is to bring you programs that are on topics that affect us as families and our communities. And with me today is my co-host, Susan Solomon, Drug Crisis in Our Backyard. Thank you for being here, Susan. Thank you, Lily, always. for having me here. And our guest today is Patrice Wallace-Moore. Thank you. From uh, CEO of Arms Acres, inpatient rehab right here in Carmel. Thanks for being here. Thanks really. for having me. Appreciate it. So tell us about you. What brings you here to this field? <laughs> it's a loaded <laughs> question. <Sure. laughs> <So, laughs> I've been in the field uh, since 1991. Um, someone told me once uh, to um, that I didn't get here by accident. And uh, I started at uh, Hope House in mm -hmm. uh, Albany, New York. I worked on the adolescent program. Uh, due to the fact that I uh, was the intake coordinator there, I connected with people from Conifer Park as they were trying to get people into long-term treatment. And um, uh, somebody there asked me one day, would I be uh, willing to um, uh, apply for a job at Conifer Park? I did. And that's how I got into the Liberty uh, Arms Acres Conifer mm -hmm, Park mm -hmm. family. And I began working at Conifer. I did that for, um, from 91 to 93. Then I moved to New York, downstate New York, and I worked at Hollywood Hospital. And I eventually became director of the adolescent program for psychiatric mm -hmm, services mm -hmm. and inpatient acute care setting. And uh, the, um, the clinical director there was Ed Sposta. Mm -hmm. Ed Sposta eventually became the CEO at Arms Acres. Oh, okay. And when he had a moment, he, uh, he came and got me. Got it. And he brought me here in 1998. Wow. And in 2000, he left and became the president of another program. And I ended up taking his place. So, you know, nothing happens by accident. Right. And I'm grateful for every opportunity t that I've had to be part of this, this field and this family. Right. When, and you, when on, um, you came up here in 1998, what position did you come up in? I came as the clinical director, uh, uh, and, um, and that was a pretty exciting opportunity for me to grow. Uh, I had gone, I, everything I had done prior to that was with adolescents. Um, I had been in adolescent uh, corrections, from corrections to short-term, to long-term treatment, to short-term treatment, to psychiatric. And then I came up here. It was kind of funny because I felt like I was becoming a grandmother. Uh, because, you know, now I was going to be supervising the person who was the adolescent director, so I didn't have to deal directly with right, the adolescents right, anymore. Right. But, you know, it's been a great transition. And and from a personal standpoint, what, um, what, are your, what is your education, educational background? I uh, have a, a master's degree in social work that I got from the State University of New York in Albany. Okay. And uh, I received that uh, master's in uh, 1990. Mm. And uh, it's been, like I said, that's been a great journey. Uh, I, I've done some other, like, post-grad training since then, but uh, most of it has really been focused towards, you know, my social work degree. I'm interested in that because when I went for my master's degree, I went for a master's in counseling and instead of social work. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, we were told that a master's in counseling was going to be better than a master's in social work. <laughs> and, and that didn't turn out to be right. true. So, but I was just interested because I didn't know if you came from um, a nursing background or medical mm -hmm. background or a behavioral background. So that was my interest in that question. My, my mother uh, was a social worker at Queens Hospital. She was the deputy de director of social work there. And my sister was a social worker, is a social worker. And so it was in our family gene pool yeah. <laughs> to yeah. become a social worker. <laughs> it was totally not what I wanted yeah. to do. But it's what fell in my lap. I was given a fellowship mm -hmm. and to go to SUNY Albany, mm -hmm. and I went, and, it was, and, and the rest was history. And substance abuse, however, was my first job after my master's degree. So that was, uh, again, 1990. I've been in the field since then. Yeah, it sounds like it was a fast track. <laughs> Patrice. Kind of. <laughs> 90, you got your master's in 90, 91, you were at Conifer Park. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, sounds like uh, was, you fast track. That's, yeah. that's and excellent. It served you well. I mean, having that social work degree, being in the field, um, you've been in the field a long time. You've seen a lot change. I've definitely seen a lot change, uh, you know, especially having the experience of, of working psychiatric as well as mm -hmm, substance abuse mm -hmm. uh, in, in, this, in this time right now, it's very critical to have uh, both, um, both uh, you know, trainings mm -hmm, behind mm -hmm. you. 
Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about what's happening? I know, you know, I've, I've heard some things about the, um, the uniting of mental health with substance abuse. And now I'm starting to see some ads come out from uh, Behavioral Health magazine that says, but uses both mental health and substance abuse in their, their title of their magazine. So I'm wondering if you could tell us kind of what's going on there and where that's headed. Well, there has been uh, there have been campaigns throughout the state about the integration of OASAS and OMH. Um, they're still uh, in the process of discussing uh, discussing that. Uh, but right now, we still have you know a very active uh, OASAS uh, mm -hmm. services, and we still have a very active uh, OMH services. Um, I'm also part of um, Governor Cuomo's Behavioral Health Services Advisory Council. This was the first time that they tried to bring together, or they have successfully brought together substance abuse programs and psychiatric programs who um, work together to, uh, to provide um, information to the governor and the legislators, legislators about changes in the field. Okay. And so uh, we work very closely together. I think it's been a very successful experience. Um, uh, this was the first time that they've ever done that. In the past, there used to be uh, the Association of uh, Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Providers, and there was um, uh, uh, an, a council for uh, mental health providers. So today, it's combined, and mm -hmm. the buzzword is behavioral health. Oh, right. But unfortunately for some of us in the field of substance abuse, sometimes uh, people see behavioral health as primarily psychiatric. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we don't want to get lost right. because it's very right. important right. that substance abuse has its own, um, shall I say, expectations mm -hmm. and people that still value mm -hmm. the, the substance abuse services that are out there, alcoholism and substance abuse services. And I guess it's so hard because the clients more and more coming with co-occurring disorders. That you can't, you, very rarely do you see just, unless it's straight psychiatric, but you know, it's more and more substance abuse also and psychiatric illness. I think it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. It's just not been recognized right, that okay. way. Right. As a person that has been in um, the field f as long as I have, when I was in the, the substance abuse programs, we saw people that right. had psychiatric issues. What would happen if the psychiatric issue was um, on the forefront of the, um, the crisis at hand, Everybody would say, oh my goodness, this person has a psychiatric right. issue. Right. Send them to the That's psychiatric right. hospital. Right. Right. Okay. If they went to the psychiatric hospital and all of a sudden they heard that they were relapsing, oh, get rid of them and put right. them in the substance abuse right. program. Right. <laughs> and so there were a lot of people that spent much of their energy trying to figure out which came first, right. the chicken or the, or the egg. Right. And right. all I know is if you put them both in the frying pan, That's you can right. eat them at the same time. That's right. So That's as far right. as I'm concerned, right. the both. chicken and the egg have their values. That's and right. so we need to make sure that we pay attention to both issues at the same time. And so right now, the reason why the um, integration has been discussed is for single door access. Uh, there are a lot of people who've had multiple issues, and so they go to this door for mm -hmm. substance abuse, this door for mental right. health, this door for physical health. Right. Uh, the, the focal point now needs to be putting a person in a setting where they go through one door, and in that same door, they can access all of those services. Right. So, you know, the program or the people that are able to do that are going to be the ones that will begin to see a lot more progress and success in the um, individuals they treat. So do where would, go ahead, where would that be for you, Arms Acres? Because Arms Acres is a 154-bed um, facility. You have... We have 162 beds. 162. We okay. have 162 beds. Uh, we have a primary care unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, an adolescent unit. And right. we have a, re a rehabilitation unit. Uh, or should I say chemical dependency rehabilitation unit. Uh, and that is... Um, that when we take a look at the services, we do treat people who have psychiatric issues. Right, right. Uh, what's the difference between Arms Acres today and many years ago is the psychiatric, that we do have psychiatric treatment. Right. We, we, there are times where people wouldn't, they wouldn't get into the doors of Arms right. Acres with certain psychiatric diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Today, you know, it, it's almost, I would say 80% of our, our clients have some type of psychiatric disorder. Now, it doesn't mean it's, at a high acute level, mm -hmm. 
but it might be something that's present. It could be uh, an affective disorder, um, such as you know, uh, maybe um, some depression or uh, maybe some manic disorders. There could be some anxiety disorders. Uh, and even today, there could be some psychiatric disorders. Uh, excuse me, psychotic disorders. Okay, psychotic. You know, we, when I say that word mental, you know, mental illness, we prefer to use mental health, but uh, people all, ma all automatically think that it's uh, schizophrenia mm -hmm. or bipolar, or some very serious That's illness. Right. And um, we know that it doesn't have to be that. That's it right. could be anxiety and depression, that, right. because that is also mental, mental illness. illness. That's right. And um, I know that my son suffered from anxiety, although I didn't know it at the time. I found out later on that he did and um, ADHD, and we found that a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of kids that have uh, succumbed to heroin were dealing with ADHD mm -hmm. and anxiety. That's right. I, I think when we, we take a look at, at some of those diagnoses that you're talking about, what often happens is when parents are not aware and the child is misdiagnosed or not diagnosed, mm -hmm. uh, they then find means to self-medicate. Right. And so the self-medication is much more dangerous, but there are a lot of people that self-medicate prior to ever doing anything. That's right. That's right. When you see them come in and you take their history, there's something there that they'll say, I, I started using and I felt better. It calmed me down. I wasn't so jumpy or I could focus. You know, I have a friend right now whose son is down in Florida and he's sober and he's you know, got a job, but he's all over the place. He wants to work and then he wants to do this job and maybe he'll get a third job and maybe he'll do this, but he needs a car and he's just all over the place because I think they've missed the mental health piece. That, th that now that he's sober, you have to address that also. It's gotta be at the same time. There's some stigmas that people, oh, yeah. uh, that prevent people from accepting certain right. diagnoses. And certain families from accepting mm -hmm. certain diagnoses. You have some families that will be okay. They would prefer right. that, that their child have a psychiatric so, disorder than a substance abuse right. disorder. And then on the flip side, that's you'll right. have some people that will say, "Well, I'd prefer my son to be substance that's abuse right. than having, that's you know, right. to be schizophrenic right. or something right. like that." So. I felt that way myself. Mm -hmm. I felt that way that I'd rather my son have a substance abuse disorder right. than uh, mental mm -hmm. illness. The thought of it was very scary to think about uh, Justin having a mental illness. It really was frightening. So yeah, I there, think that there's, a there's lot some, of... Some, there's a semblance of permanency. Yes, exactly. With the mental right. illness. That's exactly right. And you right. almost feel with the substance abuse... It'll huh, be over. I, they just stop using... That's right. They'll be they'll fine. Be better. Right. And that was before we <laughs> <That's> knew. Right. <laughs> right. How, and not only us, but all of us, right. knew how pervasive it is right. and how persistent it is and mm -hmm. relentless it is. So we, they, we thought or we think that, well, if they just, they just go to rehab, they'll be better. That's right. But we know that's not the case. Right. No, we know that right. it's a, a lifelong illness. Right. And that's what this is about because you see a lot of parents now, they don't know. It's about bringing awareness and educating people that this, they sometimes go hand in hand and there's no shame in either. Just get some sort of help. You know, go the, on. the other thing that I want that I want to mention the other issues about this the mental mental health issues or mental illness issues, medication. Mm. So when a, when a, I cannot tell you how many times people will say, "I don't want my child on That's medication," right. "I don't want my family member on medication." Well, an undiagnosed ADHD can easily change into something much more right. significant at a later time. You know, so I always tell people if you can, you know, get educated about uh, medications that the, that the provider wants to, to give, you can really work wonders for your child. Right. But people are so afraid of it, they won't, um, they won't allow it to happen in their families. And now that child is using drugs. Would you have preferred them right. to be medicated on uh, some type of medication uh, that's controlled by a, a physician right. or medication controlled by the drug dealer? That's right. Mm. right. Now, do you, in your adolescent program, do you um, deal with that? Do you deal with the ADHD and depression, anxiety in, in young adults? Absolutely. In adolescents, actually. Absolutely. We have a psychiatrist. Well, we've always had a psych. Uh, with a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner on staff to see all of our adolescents when they come in, whether they need a psychiatric uh, evaluation or not. And we've been doing that for Good. about 
three years. Um, we had a psychiatrist for two of those years, and then we had a psychiatric nurse practitioner for one. We just hired a psychiatrist uh, who started this week, Good. and she will be dedicated uh, to do uh, primarily the adolescent work and one of our adult units as well. So we're excited about um, what we offer for our young people, but we're not afraid of the, the diagnoses from the adolescents. You know, we've never been because our adolescent program is real solid. And well, your whole background is in adolescent treatment, so that's very, it, you know, that makes you feel more comfortable, I'm sure. Well, mine is, and my clinical director, who is also my associate executive director, Joanne Elliott, okay. she was the adolescent director before she was promoted. Oh. So, so there is an adolescent That's right. um, core there. Core. Uh, there's a love of adolescence in our in our building. So, you know, we're excited uh, about the work that we do with them. Do I think we can be better? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I I'm not, um, you know, ignorant to the fact that everything you can do, you can improve. Right. So I look every day at ways we can improve the work that we do uh, because I, I don't want to miss the mark. Well, it's life and death. <laughs> it is, and you know all too well yeah. you know, what that means. So now, in your adolescent program, if someone seems like they need Ritalin, do you give it to them in your uh, facility? Not Ritalin. Oh, or give something yeah. uh, we give them ADHD, something. an ADHD yes, yes. Medication. medication. You do. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You do. Okay. And now I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, and this is jumping off the adolescent part, but when people are released from um, a residential program, a rehab, a rehab inpatient, and they're on, let's say, they're on uh, Suboxone for, you know, for an extended, they're going to be on Suboxone going mm -hmm. forward, that there are... So there are m just a few or maybe no sober homes that will take them if they're on medication like that. I, I think, again, so one of the issues with Suboxone, and, and it's being addressed, is that people have been coming to take the Suboxone but not wanting to get the treatment. You know, So I, I think that people have, everything starts out with a fear attachment before they begin to see the the significance of it. And I think that's kind of what has happened with the Suboxone. But, you know, I think there is, in the past, there have always been that uh, issue that sober means sober. Right. It mm, means that you're not right. taking anything right. at all. Right. Um, so they've looked askance to medication-assisted mm -hmm. treatment. Mm -hmm. So when you when you feel that a person is, you know, they're, you know methadone has been around for mm -hmm. since the 60s. Right. And people were using methadone. Um, it is a... Um, an agonist to, um, uh, to to heroin, so it actually, you know, gives that same you know that same effect to some degree. So, but it keeps a person because it's controlled by the clinics. It keeps a person from um, using it or uh, right. you know accessing it the same way they right. do heroin. But it made people feel like I don't want my child right. on on right. heroin. Right. So, excuse me, on methadone. On methadone. Right. methadone. So. Well, you know that's a funny story because. My sister, this goes back mm -hmm. to the 60s, my mm -hmm. sister was going out with a boy, mm -hmm. because they were young then, mm -hmm. and her, his brother died of a methadone overdose. So when my son wanted to be on methadone, I wouldn't let him go right. on it. And there was a prejudice right. towards the medication. Right. And um, I think that since then, there's been, it's come to light, there's more information, mm -hmm. and information is is power. Is power. Right. right. We can make decisions That's if we have right. information. Absolutely. Without the information, we're in the dark. We could only we could only believe the rumors right. that are going around That's in right, our head. We don't know anything else. And I have to say, it's yeah. not even just information. It's the right information. Right. right. It's the because right Because there are a lot of people that <laughs> right. have information. It's, wrong. it's not always accurate. And so, you know, once a person's assumption comes connected to information, it could cause a lot of damage. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm always one, um, one of the things that we do really well well at Arms Acres is we are data driven. So we will examine something, we will evaluate it to see the effect effectiveness of it and whether or not it's important to continue. So and a lot of people take data, but they don't really uh, use it, uh, they don't analyze it, but you know, we have a real good team and we, we take a look at you know what works and what doesn't work. And we will either modify what didn't work, scrap it, you know, and do something totally new. Uh, but if it works, we're going to continue it and, you know, until we don't think it does work anymore. Do you find that the treatment is changing with the heroin epidemic um, in ways of, you know, they, I hear drug is a drug is a drug. And when it comes to heroin, 
I don't feel that. I feel that it, it's there's something different about it, or maybe it's different the way people are getting hooked on it. It's through the prescription pills that makes it different. I don't know if I'm explaining it right. To me, it makes it this different. I mean, it's the heroin, but it's not the same. The facts are treating. the facts. There are more people dying That's from right. from um, heroin. And we're going to say the opioid. Right, the opioids. Let's uh, you that. know, okay. because that's where the prescription right. drugs come in. Mm -hmm. uh, when it moves to heroin is when they are no longer able to access right. the prescription, right. which can be a little bit more expensive. Right. So the cheaper version right. is the heroin. heroin. Now, truth be told, heroin has been around for years. years. And it was it, it impacted the uh, a lot of the minority communities, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of people that were struggling. And it moved out of there at some That's point right. um, based on prescriptions That's and right. how they were being written right. and, and to more of an affluent community in different areas. And, 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 and it spread like wildfire. Mm -hmm. And it, it was not, it, they were not able to control it in right. time. So what, what has happened now is in order to really treat it, we have to really treat medication with medication, right. you know, so the medication assisted treatment is really important. And here's the key word, assisted, assisted treatment. Right. So, you know, in the past, methadone was that people would come in and they'd stand on the line, right. like you would go into the bank, you get your methadone That's and right. you go out and go to work, go, go to do business. whatever you do. And right. you come back and you get the methadone today. You got, you have to get the, if it's methadone, if it's, you know, Suboxone, if it's Vivitrol, right. whatever it is, Treatment has to, you know, therapy has to be attached to it. And so hopefully, you know, as we move forward, there will be a difference in how it's, a, it's treated. But is heroin different? No. It is. Right. It is definitely right. different, right. you know, because people are dying more and more from it. Uh, unfortunately for all of us, when we first started recognizing it was a problem. Right. And not to speak out against the managed care companies right. or, but legislation, there were they wouldn't allow people to get into treatment because they said um, that to uh, withdraw from yep. heroin wouldn't kill That's you. Right. There, That's there right. There was not, not a medical risk right. to withdrawal. That's right. But what they learned, I was going to say fail to recognize, <laughs> but what they learned was it wasn't the withdrawal that was killing people. It was the um, fact that people didn't want to withdraw. So they used again right. and the new high right. often led to the death. Right. So now what is, what is happening with that? Well, if someone comes in and they want to detox and from an opiate, what are the insurance companies saying now? Oh, the insurance companies are doing a much je better job of allowing uh, treatment programs to, to detox people from opioids. opioids. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. They, yeah. are, that's they really are. It used to be a battle. Oof. And so our... Oh, okay. Okay, our our um, treatment programs are now allowed to keep people in uh, in programs now um, and and detox them. And the legislation has really helped because if uh, if we feel that a person needs to stay and the managed care company uh, you know denies it, there there are opportunities for us to appeal. And thanks to um, you know the passing of that legislation that happened, uh, I think it was about a year and a half mm -hmm. ago, that has really helped us. Our beds are full. Unfortunately, I'm going to say, excuse me. Unfortunately, our beds are, are, are filled because of it. Yeah. Yeah, so. but it is good that they're mm -hmm. able to call a place and they're not going to hear it's not medically necessary right. because it wasn't that long ago. I mean, I know when the legislation was passed was June 2014. And when did it go into effect? Not that long ago it, it went into effect when they could no longer say it's not medically necessary and also that you have to fail Right. Fail Outpatient. first. Fail right. first. Fail They're first. not allowed to say that right. anymore. Although someone told me that a uh, facility said that to her just the other day. Because <laughs> I th oh sorry, I think that a lot of people are not aware of it, and they'll say that without knowing what the legislation is. Um, you have to fail first. Treatment providers, like they don't have the information. Some of them. What? Well, I, I think that there are some programs that might say that because then when they get the denial from the managed care companies. But they have to fight back, right. and so uh, you know we've learned how to how to fight back, and we don't want anybody else to die because they were denied treatment. They were not denied access to appropriate services. So you have to push back, and you know there are a lot of um, programs out there that do understand that, and you have to make sure that you you find a program that understands how to um, work with the managed care companies as well as uh, the families. 
Yes, I agree. That's really important. I worked in your organization for a short time. I interned there over the summer, and I saw how the um, the counselors fought for longer periods of treatment. Mm -hmm. It. I, we were just talking prior to the show, and it is a day by day, minute by minute decision. And you know, we have to give. Um, I was. We were talking actually. Uh, Lily and Susan, and I were talking. You know how ye, how years ago you would get. Um, a prescription from the doctor, mm -hmm. and they would say you have you have ten days worth of moxicillin. Right, right. You know, about day five, you feel better, and you right. forget to take. That's right. You know, the, and right. you're now trying to catch up three right. days because you right. don't take the full That's dosage. Right. Well, in in a sense, after a while, they started giving you Z packs. Right. right? That's you take right. one dose That's or right. two doses. That's right. When, when we're dealing with um, you know acute care treatment, it's like a Z pack. Right. You have to give as much as you possibly right. can in a in a short window right. because you don't know uh, how you know how you know whether the managed care is going to work with you or not. Right. So you really have to work with the families and connect people to resources as quickly as possible. You can't connect people to resources if you don't know them. That's right. Right. Exactly. So we know resources, and that helps us a lot. And you know what, Patrice? It's been great having you on the show. And I want to thank you for being here. It's been wonderful. And yeah. I wish sometimes we could just keep going. It went so fast, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, you're a wealth thank of you. information. Well, we really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you for having me. The time me. you spent here. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs>